Hello, hello, and welcome. My name is Nikki Jones, and I would like to welcome you to the HBA's inaugural LinkedIn Live. This is your time to get some, some power sessions in, get some inspiration going. We are here celebrating Black History Month. I am the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion and people operations at the Healthcare Business Women's Association. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to two of our amazing volunteer leaders, Vanessa Norte from Amgen, who is the program manager for research and development and diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. And we have Karima Sharif, who is the head of inclusive investments and partnerships at Publicis Health Media. Welcome, ladies. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to share, uh, you know, in this age of technology now, uh, things happen. So we're having some technical difficulties and uh, we're hoping that Mary Stutz will be able to join us shortly. But in the interim, we are going to have an amazing conversation with our two volunteer leaders of our Women of Color Affinity Group at HBA. HBA, or Healthcare Business Women's Association, is focused on advancing the careers of women in the business of healthcare. That means that we want to ensure that every woman has the opportunity to be able to pursue their fullest potential in the workplace. And so part of our Black History Month celebration this year, uh, which is an extension of our diversity, equity, and inclusion journey that we've been on, is to ensure that you, our, our members and our corporate partners and our key stakeholders, have the opportunity to hear from our members, to be able to hear from what is the HBA doing to make sure that our workplaces are really becoming more diverse, equitable, and inclusive, such that everyone has the opportunity to pursue their fullest potential. So I'm just excited to have this conversation here today. If you um, are joining us, if you got your lunch, please, please, please just join in the chat. We've got questions uh, that you'll be able to ask our leaders. Uh, and as Mary joins us later, you'll be able to ask her as well. So since we're in Black History Month, we've been celebrating um, the richness of those from the African-American and Black heritage. And you've been seeing on our LinkedIn, we've been featuring many of our members and volunteers and our staff to be able to share their journey. So I'd like to start off, Karima, as the co-founder of the Women of Color Affinity Group at HBA, I would love to know who are some of your sheroes that uh, really helped you when you were a young woman growing up uh, as, a, as a Black woman in the industry? Or did you even know what you wanted to do when you were <laughs> earlier? <laughs> so uh, who did you share? That's such a great question because uh, I did not know what I wanted to do, um, you know, growing up. Um, I didn't know I would land in healthcare marketing. I, I do know I loved advertising. I, I loved marketing. When I reflect on women that look like me, I don't think, I don't recall seeing that on my TV screen. Wow. Um, I kind of wanted to, I guess, be the, the Black Angela from Who's the Boss? Um, so. <laughs> That was, that was my reflection. Um, however, my mom's a nurse, so I was able to absorb a lot of that healthcare knowledge, healthcare information, and it landed me into healthcare media. So I would say I would, you know, the people that I look up to are the people that are are close to me. My mother, my maternal grandmother, my paternal grandmother. Um, they were just, and my mom. Um, well, my two grandmothers passed, but, um, those, those women, you know, just were amazing. Um, just knowing that they came up in a time where it was more difficult. Um, they had, you know, four to five children, um, you know, they were married, they worked, um, and then they, they also just loved on us. So I reflect a lot on the love that was, that I was brought up, um, uh, within of, of, of seeing my strong, grandmothers and, and my mother. Awesome. That theme of love. And again, we just celebrated Valentine's Day yesterday. <laughs> um, but that universal theme of love and undergirding 
all of us to be able to uh, reach our fullest potential. Vanessa, what about you? Who are some of your sheroes? So, you know, Nikki, it's so funny that Karima shared that story because those are my heroes too. The, the wow. women in my life, my, the women that raised me. So my mother, my grandmother, maternal, paternal, I've had strong aunts and aunties and also godmothers who you know, we're uplifting and always encouraging us as our next generation to strive for the best. I was in a unique position that I also was in Puerto Rico, right? So we were experiencing, and we still do today, the, the colorism, the issue of colorism. Mm -hmm. So there was an extra layer put on top of what we were struggling for and trying to overcome. Wow. That is that's so awesome. Thank you all so much for sharing. And we actually, we do have our guest here today, Mary Stutz. So ladies, I'm going to come back to you a little bit later on in our program. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your Shiro's. And that was a great segue to bring in Mary Stutz. Mary, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, Nikki. It is great to join you again. Um, it's always great to participate with any of the wonderful events that HBA is having, and certainly um, with this being Black History Month and the day after Valentine's Day, so hence my red. Uh <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. So Mary, Mary, you are the global Chief Inclusion and Health Equity Officer at Real Chemistry, one of our amazing corporate partners at HBA. And so we just want to thank you so much for taking time to have a conversation with us, to share with our members and our volunteers. And we're here celebrating Black History Month. We also want to be able to share some inspiration um, and also touch on some of the issues that are really pertinent today uh, at, for business leaders, for those of us in the healthcare industry. So uh, I was able to ask Karima and Vanessa. So now it's your turn. Yeah. Who were some of your sheroes? And we're looking from a Black history standpoint, you are living Black history, but I would love to know, and I'd love for our, our listeners to hear from you. Who were some of your sheroes that you looked upon when you were growing up? Well, I would say yeah, my biggest shiro um, was my foster mom. So I became a foster child at the age of five years old. And my foster mother was a uh, fifth grade school teacher. And she also became one of the first um, teachers in the state of Louisiana uh, wow. certified in special education because um, they put all the problem, and as we know from traditional history, Black boys, um, into her room, and they weren't problem kids at all, but she, uh, but her, she knew how to inspire them, how to encourage them, how to get them to perform, and her, her motto was any child, uh, every child can learn, and that was yeah. why she did so well and why she was invited. Uh, to go and get this uh, credential when special education first became a thing for teachers to be able to do that. But she also inspired me as a foster child, the trauma of going from, from that. My mother, um, my mother who is, is uh, still alive and just turned 100 last year. Uh, Beautiful. Yeah, my natural mother had a, a nervous breakdown at uh, when I was five years old. She had five children pretty close together, husband left her, and it, the pressure was just too much. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so mental illness among Black women is is really um, a, a thing that we need to be much, very focused on and understand and, and be paying attention to because we're always so busy, usually mm -hmm. taking care of, our, of everybody else. Uh, that we don't take care of ourselves. But for me, um, going into uh, the foster home when my foster father uh, was a Baptist minister and then his wife, as I said, the fifth grade school teacher, and she was so nurturing and encouraging. And her thing to me was, um, you're an A student. And she would always, and you know, so every time if I brought home a B or God forbid a C, you know, uh, that was her thing and how she motivated. It's like a B is good. Um, she didn't say a C was good, but she was. <laughs> <laughs> a B is good, uh, but you're an A student. She knew your potential. She knew my potential and, and she gave me voice. 
and she co she continued to inspire me about my voice. And she was the one who told me because I was five years old. I don't even remember. But when she came, when they drove from Louisiana to Texas to to pick us up, um, they were only going to take my two older sisters because they were school age. And in those days, they didn't have daycare, they didn't have kindergarten, mm -hmm. preschool, any of that. Um, and so they weren't going to take me. And she said, I was standing on the porch looking at them because in Texas, they got porches, y'all. And um, I, and they got in the car and loaded my sister in, my sisters who were six and seven because we were all stair steps. And she said, I looked at them and she said, all of a sudden, just before they closed the door, I jumped off the porch and ran across the yard and jumped across the ditch because they had ditches in Texas and got in the car with my little dirty doll and said, hmm, you think you're going to leave me, but you ain't. <laughs> and it was my foster father who did not have the heart to put me out of the car. And he said, let's just take her and let big mama keep her during the week. You know, every black family got a big mama. Absolutely. So foster mom's mother, and who was also my hero, she was uh, part black and part uh, Choctaw Indian. <laughs> but my foster grandmother and uh, and and so she keeps, you know, the goal, the plan was she would keep me during the week and I would go to them on the weekends. I did go to them on the weekends, but I never moved in with the sheep. Big mom kept me the whole time, but it was which was a great thing. Um, it turned out to be a really uh, good thing. But those two women had such an impact in my life. And I remember that, which is why. I just can't talk enough about the urgency that we have right now to um, prepare that future workforce, future generation, future leaders of yeah. Black uh, boys and girls, because uh, at Real Chemistry, we just had our first Real Health Equity Summit, and we had a wonderful panel with our CEO panel and Dr. Joy Creer Perry and, and Dr. Wayne Frederick from Howard University, along with the CEO of Genentech, Alexander Hardy, and uh, Dr. Michelle McMurray-Heath from Bio. Um, but during that conversation, they talked about one of the biggest challenges with diversifying the workforce is that uh, people don't see when they look at Black children, mm -hmm. they do not see doctors, lawyers, uh, future scientists, wow. researchers, they don't see academics, they don't perceive of our children that way. And so then they are not uh, getting the traditional opportunities or even being treated the same in the school system. Even all the way through college, unless they, you know, attend a historically black university, they are not uh, being perceived that way. And so that makes it even more um, difficult for them. And, and there's something that I just want to share with our audience that um, I have to give uh, credit to Dr. Reed Tuxon about this, but it's so impactful for Black History Month. I like to um, take this and, and share this, um, you know, the, so that people understand about, you know, yes, the health disparities among the Black community are rooted in generations of structural racism, segregation, environmental degradation, economic and educational suppression. So, you know, closing, we need, I'm very focused on closing the healthcare gap, but I'm also very close, focused on the education gap as well. Right. Because I want to invest in our youth. My mom, my foster mom instilled that <laughs> into me. But all of these things, um, it's going to require this deliberate and sustainable and intentional effort to address the social determinants of the entire ecosystem to really identify and eradicate bias. But what I want to share, um, you know, for the when people think about black history, there is a lack of clarity about what it really means for the current moment. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I want to just recognize why Black History Month is so important to me. Please, please. That's important. Absolutely. Yeah. So remember that Black people came to this country 400 years ago. So sorry. Black people came to this country 400 years ago, and that began 250 years of enslavement. And during those 250 years, when we were a slave, 10 to 15 generations of white people grew wealth and owned land. 150 years ago, we were so-called freed, and that was when the immersion into the Jim Crow laws began, which 
basically kept us enslaved. It suppressed our vote. We had no ownership, ability of wealth. And during that time, also, we saw things like white Americans erected monuments to slavers. For example, 125 years ago, James Marion Sims had a statue erected and is lauded on being the father of obstetrics and gynecology, OBGYN. But he did his work operating on unanesthetized slaves. Yeah. That's how he created his science. And so it's e that is even more insulting as we look at how we are failing Black women and Black children in medicine with uh, Black women having the highest incidences of maternal and infant morbidity. So meanwhile, during that 125 years, another five to 10 generations of, of whites prospered. 90 years ago was the infamous Tuskegee experience. 60 years ago, my parents and foster parents were finally legally able to vote. Legal to vote just 60 years ago, even though we were so-called freed from mm -hmm. discrimination, yet we were consigned to segregated schools. We were living in neighborhoods, uh, denied bank loans. And again, all this time, meanwhile, several more generations of white people prospered. And so what I'm saying and what other black leaders and physicians and professionals are saying and hoping to help everyone understand is that when we talk about these social disparities in health, the reason we are in a place of poor housing, of mm -hmm. suboptimal education, the absence of quality food, all of these things which contribute to health, the lack of financial and economic stability. This wasn't just something that happened. Right. It's not that we were just delivered into this historical moment. This has been a long-term experience. And then it's almost as if in uh, society today, people are saying, well, there must be something wrong with Black people, that they find themselves in this position, but never equating or understanding the journey of how we were kept down for so long mm -hmm. while the rest of America was allowed to prosper. Um, mm -hmm. And so now they want to blame the victim for their victimization. So blaming the victim or the patient or the conditions that have been for for conditions that have been inflicted upon them by centuries of systemic racism and oppression is just not going to move the needle for us. So Black History Month should not be this sterile celebration, although it is important to celebrate people who have prevailed despite mm -hmm. such odds, which is why I celebrate my mom, my foster mom, and, and so many of them, and, and Black men, my foster father, all these folks who prevail. But it also needs to be a time where we understand how come we are where we are. And it's not the fault of somehow lazy, unintellectual people who couldn't pull themselves up by their bootstraps. So, you know, and this is why the only way we're going to move the needle to change this, to advance health equity, to advance education equity, economic mm -hmm. equity, um, you know, in health and well-being, is that we have to have these uncomfortable conversations. Change doesn't yes. happen if everybody is comfortable. And as Black people, we are actually conditioned to care more about white people's feelings more than making sure that they care about ours. I'm just, you know, we just got to get these things out in the open because it's so important. So we have to double down on solutions. And that's that's a big focus for me right now. Again, certainly when it comes to uh, health equity. And it really, we are seeing now, it's a big focus for our industry overall. Absolutely. Because we're all human. We're, we're all human. Yeah, but there's got a, different experiences. Yes, there's a societal and a business reason, though. Because with these biases and inequities going throughout our entire system, uh, companies are leaving billions of dollars on the table because they are not getting diverse people in their clinical trials. They are not making sure that the non-diverse specialists are prescribing the newest therapies and medications to people of color. The biases are through the entire system. And so we have to focus on that because that's going to lift all of us up. Right. So you talked about the, the history of um, the Black experience and, and a lot of the inequities that have given rise to what we're seeing today. Definitely over the last you know, two years, we've seen with the pandemic, the ongoing effects. Um, so I would love to hear, because we've got a wide audience here today, uh, 
in reference to you personally, how were you, what questions did you ask yourself as a woman, as a black woman in the industry, trying to, to make your way, always pursuing to your fullest potential? What were some questions that you asked yourself to help you at each juncture of your career? Because you've had a varied career at many different companies. Um, what were some of the questions that you asked yourself, if you could help our listeners today? Yeah. So um, one of the main questions that I asked myself, and it was something that I, I um, was challenged with and as I was doing some of my continuing education, but I, I love this question. What would you do if you had no fear? That's what, oh. what would you do if you had no fear? That has kept me going and accepting these opportunities, pushing uh, for additional progress and opportunities that I might not otherwise have uh, pursued, like getting onto a corporate board and mm. you know, understanding that career trajectory um, and, and just kind of always asking myself, what would you do if you had no fear? And the other question, what would you do if money were no object? And Whoa. That, yeah, <laughs> those are the money were no object. And so if money were no object, this is why I formed the nonprofit T-Cell, the Center for Excellence in Life, because if money were no object, I would be focused on making sure that underrepresented youth and women, because I've always focused overall on women, not just Black women, but advancing women in general, um, but to make sure that they are getting the development uh, the access to people of power mm -hmm. and the information and the vision to see themselves in these roles and, and to make sure that they are being instilled with the confidence to pursue it. I love those questions. The, the chat box is blowing up. It's on fire. Um, and you're speaking directly to, um, and that's the thing, the, the beauty of HBA is we're here, we want to support all women. What is it going to take for all of us? You know, a rising tide raises all ships. Um, and there are certain questions that as professional women, we need to be able to ask ourselves uh, certain points in our career. So uh, you are a Black history change maker. I just want to applaud you right now for the waves that you have made in the industry. So I want to segment uh, really quickly. I want to bring back into the conversation Karima and Vanessa, who are leaders of our Women of Color Affinity Group, and uh, kind of continue our conversation here, round us out. We're going to take some questions from the chat box. So if you have some questions, attendees, please, 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 this conversation is on fire right now. We're so excited. Um, pop them in the chat box and we'll be able to answer them live. But I wanted all of us to come back into the virtual chat room um, for a moment there's been so much happening over the last um, few years with the, the pandemic, but with the racial unrest. And, and most recently, um, this is a topic that we've not really historically addressed. But as women, I want us to be able to uh, talk about that. Mary, you mentioned it earlier in relation to mental health. Um, and that it's critical and particularly for all women, but um, particularly for Black women. And since Black History Month, the theme for this year is health and wellness. Yeah. So I want to talk about um, mental health. And as we, we heard about uh, Chesley Chris and, and the untimely death uh, by suicide just a, a few weeks ago, yeah. she was a Black professional, degree, um, highly loved, what are some of the things that we can do to be able to help those of us that are here um, in the profession, in the healthcare industry, in the industry that is, you know, very hot right now, and but hot with also stress and yeah. pressure? Um, mm -hmm. I want to start off with you, and then we'll bring in Vanessa and Karima to hear their thoughts. What are some things that we can do? So, um, to try to address this. So, you know, I talk about this quite a bit, obviously, with my mother having um, had issues with mental health issues. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, life comes at us too hard, too fast sometimes. Mm. We need to understand that. And the only way, personally for me, the only way that we are going to survive that is to engage our spirits. And so understanding the importance of engaging your spirit, because if you don't engage your spirit, you'll you'll quit too soon. You'll give up. My first child died of a crib death at two months old. 
So I understand about what I am a, a you know a living proof of the impact uh, to black women and, and children. Um, so she died of sudden infant death syndrome. And I was totally devastated. I said, I'm never going to have children again. This is so horrible. Um, I, I am not going to be able to survive this. And through engaging my spirit and understanding that my child died, but I didn't die with her. Mm. So I'm still here. There is more that I need to do in life. And then later on in life, um, you know, going through a divorce and and losing custody of my my second child who who was born and lived obviously um because i ha didn't make enough money to fight uh, my husband in court and to get a good lawyer and i remember driving back from the airport where i had to drop her off to go back to chicago to her dad and i was here in california and there was a place on the freeway where you could literally drive into the bay if you wanted to there are no barriers or anything and being su suicidal at that moment. But I remember hearing at that moment, the voice of, a, I, took, I, I took a program to learn how to actually be a counselor on the phone for people. And wow. in that training, the black woman who led that program emphasized to us over and over again, I never knew I would have to take that advice for myself. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Mm. And all of a sudden, as I got to that point where I wanted to veer off the freeway, I could hear her voice. Yeah, because she was in my spirit by then. Uh, you know, it, suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. I kept going. And then not many years later, I got my daughter back. I got remarried, had two more kids. I was driving up and down that same freeway, going to work at Genentech, making bank. Uh, and going on vacations, uh, you know, riding in the back of limos because the company provided them for senior level executive to go for trips wherever I was traveling all over the world. It's temporary. You're, it will change. It will get better, but you've got to engage your spirit. Wow. Thank you so much, Mary. Karima? Yeah, I totally agree with everything that Mary said. I think for me personally, there are three areas that I focus on and I encourage others to focus on. Um, it's one, one is, as Mary mentioned, tuning into your spirituality. Mm -hmm. I would say tuning into my faith, um, yeah. knowing that trials are going to come, but yeah. when you have God on your side, you can make it through. Um, also working out. Um, I think that was something that I pushed myself during a pandemic to start to really look at my full self and and not focus on a negative and kind of go to the gym, take walks, you know, talk to others. Um, and then lastly is pour into others. I feel like mm -hmm. as much as I can pour into the into my stranger, into my sister, if someone wants me to, you know, to do something, even just being charitable with a smile. I think yeah. that helps um, helps to kind of bring that all to life for me. Um, and those are the three areas that I focus on. And again, I, I encourage others to focus on. Awesome. Thank you, Vanessa. And we're going to take some questions right after Vanessa. OK, well, I, too, lean in my faith into my faith when yeah. it comes to my wellness. I, I really believe that this, too, shall pass. Mm -hmm. And so that keeps me going. Um, I, I've started just recently with the pandemic, starting to take time at the beginning of the day to really um, meditate or pray. Um, a tip that I like to share with folks who are seeking to start that habit is to start simple with just looking at the verse of the day. If, if you're a believer, that's just an example of something that you can do and really take a moment to digest that and remind yourself, what are your true values, right? Because we often forget and we might put work, for instance, as a priority, but we need to reshift our thinking and by doing that on a daily basis, it helps you to keep on track with that mentality. Wow. Thank you all so much. And th this is what it takes. You know, we're all going through something and it, it takes the collective effort of us, the courage for us to be able to share mm -hmm. that, you know, there's something mm -hmm. not quite right. And then to be able to connect. And that is the beauty of having 
um, you know, opportunities like this to connect and share. In the chat box, Mary, Karima, and Vanessa, so many are uh, testifying that your boldness to share your stories have mm -hmm. helped them. Um, and, and so there is one question that's popped up here. Um, and Mary, I'll, I'll drop this one to you. What are the most powerful lessons that you've learned in advocating for yourself or others? Yeah. Um, I would say <laughs> one of the most powerful lessons I've learned in advocating for myself is to ask for what you want. Mm. Uh, and that is something that I, um, you know, I have, I, we are always so much advancing other people and, and promoting. It's just something we inherently do as women. And I remember I almost missed out on probably one of the biggest promotions of my life because I was advocating for all my peers and did not advocate for myself. Wow. And, uh, you know, I think I, I, you know, I was in bed in the middle of the night when I realized oh, I didn't say why I would be good for the job. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Like, what were you thinking? And I, and I say, I'm telling you right now, I pray, God, I'm stupid. Please <laughs> tell me what to do. And so it was like, write a memo. And I wrote this memo and, you know, and came back while I firmly believe either any of my peers would be perfect for this job. Our boss had left and there were like four of us that were up to take this leadership role. I firmly believe my peers are totally qualified for this role, but I realized I neglected to mention why I also am qualified. And I went through uh, these things and sent it to him. I was like, you know, and, and I got the job. But I'm just saying, if I just, we have to ask, and that gets to what would I do if I had no fear? Right. right. And so we have to make sure that we are checking ourselves and, and wondering why are we not pushing forward? Why are we not uh, going to this next level, whether it's going to graduate school or, or whatever it has to do. I had a colleague at one job early in my career who wanted to get a lot of the same opportunities that I had. Um, and she was a Caucasian woman, um, but she didn't have a degree. So I kept saying, you should go back to school, get your degree, get your degree. And at the time, you know, she finally just said to me, I'm 36 years old. By the time I go back to school, I'll be 40. And I was like, you're going to be 40 anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it was better to be 40 with a degree than 40 without a degree. I mean, so it's things like that, that we rationalize. And it, that's why it's good to be vulnerable and talk to people and let them know what you're struggling with because we can help each other. It's yeah. not about people being nosy or, you know, thinking everybody trying to be in your business. It's like, you know, get some wise counsel, let others know what you're struggling with. Um, and that's going to help you in the long run. Absolutely. And, and part of being a good leader is also knowing how to share and work with those who are not like you, not from your cultural persuasion. Right. So it's across the board. And this is where allyship really, really, really comes to light. Yeah. Um, we don't all have to look the same or come from the same background or have the same faith tradition, but it's a matter of understanding that there are gifts that all of us have been given, that when you put us all together, we're different, but when you put us all together, we create a beautiful mosaic. So I am just excited. Um, that I've had this time to talk with you ladies. You all are amazing. I could go for another hour. Um, but I know people have to go to lunch and they have to go back to work. Um, so the comment section, we've got so many other questions coming here. We are um, coming down to the close of this segment. This was our first LinkedIn Live. I would like to give um, Karima and Vanessa the opportunity to share about some upcoming events for our Woman of Color Affinity Group. Um, so Vanessa, if you want to share really quickly. Oh yes, happy to, so excited. So first of all, thank you for this opportunity. It's been wonderful. Great to hear your stories too, Mary. Um, you know, one thing I have to admit before I share what event we have coming up is that one of the benefits of the Women of Color Affinity Group is that we provide that platform to help each other out. I've really leaned in into Karima to help polish 
that skill of advocating for myself because I have to admit, I'm still a work in progress in that. And that's where the affinity comes in, right? You have that kind of support. And with that, we wanna invite everyone to a hot cocoa that we have coming up. Please go to the HBA website and take a look at our events. It's open to all the members. And it's an opportunity for members and advocates to network and celebrate the Black History Month honoring our own Black Her Story makers. So bring your hot cocoa, that's our signature event. And then also coming up, we have on the 22nd, we have a wonderful event that is about health equity. And this is an event brought to you by the Pacific region, as well as the women of color. And it's, a, it's the second of a three-part series on health equity. We're taking a look at the past, how we got here, the present, what we can do now, and the future, a look at the roadmap ahead. And that's coming up on February 22nd. I'll pass the floor on to Karima to add any extra details that she might want to share with all of you listeners. No, that, thank you, Vanessa. Yeah, so we're we're doing it big for February, as, as Vanessa uh, alluded to. We have a lot of great signature events. And then remember what we brought to the table in 2021. We book ended a lot of our conversations around health and wellness. Our February event in 2021 in collaboration for our Fit to Lead Affinity Group, as well as the American Heart Association, because um, heart disease is probably one of the number one killers for Black women. So we made sure that we you know, we poured into that topic and, and brought some relevancy there. And then at the end of the year, we had our signature wellness summit at the annual conference. So just, that just gives you a little bit of a highlight of where we've been the last couple of the last year during the pandemic is really tapping into the community, one another, as well as our full health and wellness self, spiritually as well as physically. So we're really excited to continue the program and the conversations with you all. Um, so please, please join us for those, those two events in February and we'll have more events in 2022. Um, so just you know, join us and join our membership. You can follow us on LinkedIn or the HBA portal for Women of Color Affinity Group. Awesome, ladies, thank you so much. And what you see before you are two of our volunteer leaders at Healthcare Business Women's Association. Uh, they started this affinity group. HBA has a number of affinity groups. And remember affinity groups, allow you to get to know people on a more intimate basis out of our larger over 11,000 member network. Uh, you can find an affinity group. We have a entrepreneurship um, affinity group. We've got a women in science. We've got a women in healthcare give back, fit to lead, so many other affinity groups. You can find your space to be able to grow, hone your professional the um, leadership skills, and just find an opportunity to maybe get to know someone from a different culture or a different background than you. Um, so Mary, I want to close this out with you. All right. If there is one parting word, again, when I, you've got to go back and read the comments. Everyone is just over the moon. They took their, some people skipped their meetings. Okay. They had work meetings because they said they needed to hear Mary's studs. So if you could just leave us with a parting word. Yeah. Be so gracious. I do. My, my parting word is about inclusive leadership and the need for us to be inclusive and to be aware of how we are treating each other. And I define inclusion as making sure that people on your team, and even when you, if you're evaluating whether you feel included in your job, do you feel valued, celebrated, respected, last two are critical, have access to the same opportunities as everyone mm -hmm. else and are being treated fairly or the same as everyone else. That is the definition of inclusion. And uh, I can't emphasize enough how the affinity groups are so helpful in uh, helping companies and organizations to achieve inclusion and that the affinity groups are for everybody in the organization. Companies are the best places to work for diversity and inclusion. Uh, their affinity groups are open across the organization. You can join any affinity group you want, even if it's you're not. Actually, we want you to join them mm -hmm. if you are not a member of that affinity so that you can immerse yourself into other cultures because that's the 
the only way you are going to become an inclusive leader. You've got to immerse yourself into other cultures so that you have cultural empathy, so that you have human respect for humans and you understand cultural norms and how people make decisions, how they feel, how they want to be treated. And these are the things that we are focusing on now when we look at this broader advancing of inclusion and equity in across the workforce. Awesome. Well, ladies, um, I, I I brought these roses. Actually, my husband gave them to me <laughs> for Valentine's Day. But I want you to have one from me to you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of our attendees today. Uh, this was an amazing time. Look for more. HBA is definitely on the journey. The journey continues. So look for more from us uh, in the upcoming weeks and go and make yourself an amazing day. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.